You were here uh, a moment ago talking about the horrors of firmware security uh, and our perhaps unorthodox methods of trying to uh, reduce that. Um, Matthew was talking about the challenge of having to write a bootloader for the Commodore 64. I've done that. Um, and we can talk a little bit about that as well. But really, where I want to begin, I mean, what Matthew talked about was all of this problem of you know, the, this complexity that is opaque. It is extremely hard to know you know, is your management engine on version 12? And if it is, is it really on version 12? Or is it saying it's on version 12? Um, you know, how many divisions of the NSA are fighting for control over your SMC at the moment? Uh, you know, yeah, that's right. All of them, someone says. Um, the key is we can't tell. We have point, uh, passed what I call uh, the point of magic. Um, Arthur C. Clarke in his three laws, um, his third law was any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Um, so on that basis, I thought we should actually begin the, uh, the talk with admittedly an extremely lame magic trick, uh, but nonetheless, uh, with one nonetheless. So we have my laptop here, we have my presentation, this is all excellent. We have a hoop. <laughs> and I can demonstrate that my laptop is not connected <laughs> in any way, shape or form to the HDMI output. <laughs> yes. Um, so if my laptop, um, and I'll trust Benno to not rootkit my firmware, uh, will keep my laptop well out of the process. So that from here on we know that everything I'm doing is not involving that laptop. Uh, no x86 CPUs were harmed in the making of the remainder of this talk. Uh, because in fact, the slides are coming from the 8-bit computer. Uh, we have our own presentation software that we have written. So what we have here looks like a Commodore 64, um, and to all intents and purposes it can be. In actual fact, what it is is an FPGA re-implementation of the Commodore 65 with a few additional little add-ons. So uh, a few of you may know about the Commodore 65, so you get the occasional, uh, you know, whether it's a slash dot news piece or the register or someone saying about how a prototype is sold for like 20,000 euros or 80,000 euros or something. Um, I owned one and I sold it before they were worth quite that much, which is a bit sad. I had fond memories of it, and so I decided to make a new one. And then we started thinking about some of the, um, these security issues, in particular around mobile devices uh, and whether we could do something about it. Uh, so let me, uh, we need to load our presentation software, of course. Uh, we'll actually make the CPU go faster so that we don't spend forever waiting for it to load. Comma eight for those who remember. Okay. Uh, so we'll load up our presentation software. <laughs> um, it is, of course, Commodore 64 software, so it would not be complete without a crack screen. <laughs> um, even if I had to supply the originals myself to the cracking group, uh, who provided the crack. Um, so we can uh, leave that there for a moment uh, so that we have time to read all the greets and everything as we, uh, we go through things. And so as I was making this talk, it was really, there were three different talks that I thought about uh, that had, uh, you know, that this was really trying to do. We only have time for one. So each of you have to choose which talk you want to listen to and, uh, you know, pay attention from that perspective. Uh, so one of them is this whole question of how can we make a computer that we can trust in this modern age. Uh, and another talk is this whole question of digital sovereignty. How can we actually be sovereigns over the hardware we own? And of course, as an open source community, this is a topic that comes up repeatedly in so many different ways. Uh, and finally, there's one about reducing the resources required to innovate in the mobile telephony space. Because I mean, even I mean, my regular mobile phone is perhaps, is arguably one of the best Android phones you can get from an open perspective, it's a fair phone too. I can take it apart, I can take the screen off without any tools, I can run whatever I want on it within reason. But as Matthew said about in the previous talk, we've got no idea really what's actually going on in there and it's too complex to actually have confidence. So that's the three uh, general talks that we want to have. And occasionally it does this, it's an 8-bit computer, but that's fine. We can reboot it quite quickly. 
it takes longer for the screen to recapture than it does for the computer to boot. Oops. And then this, the, the fun joys of experimental hardware on this one. If you, if you don't wiggle the joystick, the keyboard doesn't start working. <laughs> I should oh, yep. poke 0, 0.65 again for a fast CPU. Um, so we can run our 6502 at 40 megahertz uh, in here rather than the usual pedestrian one, which is um, uh, quite helpful. Oh, there we are, right. So in the short way, Commodore O to open, we want slides one. Loading, 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 right. Um, F5, of course, is presentation mode, right? This is universal on all things, so F5 and I now have my slide clicker. <laughs> um, so really, in, here are the, the five kind of things that I want to cover through in this talk then. So I want to talk about why it is so hard, in fact, to make an open source um, smartphone. This is, you know, this is a lot of work required to do it. Um, and you know, smartphones are dangerously untrustable. Uh, there's a bunch of topics on this that, uh, you know, that Matthew has kind of led in in the previous talk again. Um, talk about our approach uh, to trying to change this, how we think is a viable way to do it. Uh, and then I'm a, a great fan of proof by example. Um, so we have here this Commodore 64. So we've already said about some of the interesting features it has. What I hadn't previously mentioned, but you would have seen if you watched the teaser video, um, is that this is a 4G Commodore 64. Uh, and we'll get to that uh, in due course. Um, so those of you who have a local SIM card or are willing to pay international calling rates to call a Commodore 64, um, you can get ready to do that. Bear in mind that your phone number will appear on the screen when you call. So, um, borrow, yes, borrow somebody else's phone to do it. Um, yes. Although, actually, I think someone tried the VoIP yesterday and it wouldn't call. Okay. I, I'll trust you. Um, right. So, we'll go through the, the demo and then, really, you know, of course, it's an open source project. So, if anyone is interested in being involved in this whole space, not necessarily about making a mobile Commodore 64, we're happy to do that, um, but really about making the framework to make it very easy for people to innovate in this mobile space. Uh, but without further ado, um, so why on earth are mobile phones so hard to make on an open source basis? Um, the first point is, of course, actually the need for NDAs to get access to the documentation for the modern chipsets. That it is practically impossible, I would say, and I'm happy to hear from if there are any mobile chipset vendors here who are happy to uh, provide chipsets with complete documentation so that we can make something completely open from the ground up with no binary blobs. Um, I would be delighted to hear from you. I am, however, much more likely to get run over by a unicorn running through from that door to that door at precisely 4.53 this afternoon. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> and, and won't be covered for it, exactly. Um, and so this is the first problem. And that actually then feeds into the second problem. Even if you had the documentation, it's a huge effort to actually pull this stuff up from the ground. And if you don't have the documentation, then you get to have that whole wonderful, you know, whodunit kind of game, which is called reverse engineering, um, to try and work out how on earth you can actually do this. Uh, the next point is that uh, miniaturization, of course, is also just really expensive to do. Um, and then you end up being obsolete before you begin, and then, you know, doing large production runs of hardware is expensive. And so we can sort of dive into those in a, uh, a little more detail. Um, this one I think we've probably actually already covered, except for the, the comment here about, you know, we often get stuck with obsolete chips that we have got the documentation through some horrible accident that involved the vendor some time ago before they realized. Um, Atheros 9K being a great example of this in the Wi-Fi space, right? You know, the several mesh extenders that we make we're using the Atheros 9K, despite it being a 2004 vintage chipset, something like that, I reckon. They are positively ancient, but you can do ad hoc Wi-Fi on them, and so we keep using them. Um, the reverse engineering, we said, is, uh, is hard. And then, like with the Ath 9K chips, I'm terrified, in one sense, for the day when they stop being available. Fortunately, they're so obnoxiously cheap that everyone keeps using them, uh, and they remain in production. Uh, but Oh, I would love an Ath 9K with two serial ports instead of one, but there's no hope of that because no one's going to redo the silicon uh, because then we won't get the documentation. Uh, so as we said, you get the chipset and you go, yay, let's now try and adapt a reference hardware design as the minimum effort path to having a, an open source mobile phone. And the Fairphone is actually probably a pretty good example of that. Uh, and if you talk to those guys, uh, they're fantastic, uh, but they are flat out trying to maintain 
the, you know, the, the port of Android to the phone and to have the open source, more open source version than the, um, the googly one. Um, and both are important. And it, so it's just, you know, this is insane that it's impossible to kind of, you know, for someone to decide that they just want to make a custom phone to meet a particular need. I mean, how many were here for the keynote this morning? Yep, heaps of you. So this whole idea of doing open source medical device innovation, what if you wanted to make an open source mobile phone that, you know, in that particular case might implement the open pancreas thing? So you've got to kind of do all this hardware integration, so then you only got one device instead of two, that would be great, but it's too much work for someone to do. Um, and we'll talk about this a little bit more down the track, but what about if you had someone who had uh, you know, who wanted a braille screen on a phone, um, or who had cerebral palsy, and of course, you know, cerebral palsy and a number of other uh, of these conditions manifest in different ways for different people. Um, you know, some people might actually be able to use a joystick like this really well. So it's like a phone with a joystick, or the arcade buttons can be quite good, or they might need something that is, uh, you know, a, a quite different tactile interaction means. And at the moment, it's just it's impossible to actually try and make these things. Um, and then. You know, we've got this issue of, uh, you know, even if we managed one project to work in this space, we can't have the simultaneous exploration of different ideas and different concepts and different hardware because it's simply too much effort and we can't get enough people to do it. Uh, yes, little box, big price. Um, in one sense, there's actually not that much to say here. The smaller you want to make something, the higher your, uh, you know, your non-returnable engineering costs will be, the higher your unit costs will be. It's just expensive to make teeny tiny things. Uh, and so, again, if we're talking about a, a small community project, it's just not feasible to make mobile phone-sized mobile phones uh, because we just don't have the cash uh, to do it, even if we had the time and effort uh, for the most part. And then, of course, you know, whatever chipset you've chosen and managed to integrate and make small and make cheap, assuming that you had overcome all of these uh, things, um, you're going to have to do it every 12 months, in all likelihood, uh, to keep up to date. Uh, and so, you know, we need to have a zebra running through every day at 4.53 in the afternoon uh, to have any chance of keeping up with it. And this is, it's just not going to happen. Uh, and then, of course, you have to maintain everything that you had uh, before you. Uh, and so, again, if you manage to solve all of those issues, you know, an individual unit, if you make one, will cost a fortune, and the only other option is to make a pile to bring the price per unit down, but then you're still left needing a huge mountain of cash uh, to do anything. Uh, and so this is some of the problems that we're trying to solve. So let's then talk about how dangerously untrustable smartphones are and why we actually still think that this needs to happen in some kind of way. Um, so there have been plenty of backdoors uh, you know, or at least scares of backdoors for phones. And remember, we're in the era of magic. We can't tell necessarily whether any particular threat is actually kind of real. Like, you know, we listen to Matthew and, you know, there's folks asking him questions about are there better vendors or worse vendors, which is actually saying, really, you know, between the lines is, I have no idea whether my computer is safe and I have no idea to tell whether a particular computer from a particular vendor is safe. Uh, and the Galaxy S2 backdoor scare was a good example of that. In retrospect, now, nearly 10 years later, it probably wasn't that bad. It could do some stuff, but probably not everything. Um, but it took years for a few different teams of researchers to actually piece that together enough to you know, change that whole you know, 15,000 word summary to mostly harmless. Um, and we, we just don't have the resources uh, to do that. Uh, and so this really, you know, we generalize that out. How can you verify anything about your modern system? And I think, oh, no, oh, we'll go back. Um, so, you know, we look at modern CPUs with billions of transistors and operating systems and everything with, you know, billions of lines of code by the time you factor in all the main applications you're running. What chance do we have of actually verifying that? And if we think about uh, Meltdown and Spectre, so AMD and Intel CPUs were both vulnerable to this for approximately 20 years before the problems were really picked up you know, in the last 12 to 18 months. Think about how many hardware design verification engineers Intel and AMD must have. How many you know, verification engineer millennia went into those chips? and still let these things through. Now, it might actually be that they kind of raised flags and the marketing people stopped them from stopping it, uh, but that actually also 
speaks to the problem, right? That these things are going to continue to happen even if we could verify them. Uh, and so, you know, it's just not possible to verify modern devices. And then we have ah, the joy that is binary blobs. Oh, how I love the binary blob. Um, once for all, never updated. Uh, you know, the bugs baked in so they can be discovered by archaeologists in, you know, 4,000 years time in the future. And generally undermining the sovereignty over our own devices. Do you own the device that you think, well, do you own the device that you paid for? Let's put it that way, right? You've paid for it, you have physical custody of it, but do you actually own the device? Or how many other people own the device, even if you might cohabit the device with them? Which would be nice if the NSA did good backups for us. Um, and so this really is the central theme. Oh, and I have an extra N in there, don't I? <laughs> Actually, I can use the joystick too. And now you get to see there's a fun bug in this. It'll like mush up a couple of the letters when I go back up. We, we, we have since found and fixed the bug. So I should actually say that this, um, ah. um, this presentation software was written by myself and uh, a student in a semester. Radically simpler than trying to uh, you know, uh, to make modern complicated software. Again, a thing it will come back to. And so how do we get back to being uh, sovereign over our own devices? Um, and then we have this whole problem of over-integration where, and I, I love this, the microphone on a mobile phone is directly connected to the cellular modem chip, which is directly connected to the lawful intercept module of the cellular network, or the unlawful intercept module of the nearest stingray. This is, shall we say, unhelpful. Um, and then, just to add to the fun, it's not just that it can be listening into your microphone, um, it typically will have complete DMA access over the main memory because this is actually a cheaper way to make a mobile chipset, right? You have multiple cores sharing a bus and some memory, and you say to the cellular modem, okay, good little cellular modem, only use that memory over there and this DMA transfer area that we have agreed will exchange high-speed cellular data so we can get really fast internet on our device without having to have two chips. Um, Marvellous idea if security is not what you're trying to do. Um, and so you might be thinking, hold on a moment, this is a crazy man giving a presentation from an 8-bit computer holding a joystick the size of a small planet. Why should I trust anything that he has to say about modern computing? And my response to that simply is, prove to me beyond reasonable doubt that would hold up in a court of law that this is untrue. And you can't, right? And this is, again, the heart of the problem. Things are now so complex and so impossible to dive into and examine that we cannot tell what is going on. Uh, and hence my resorting to blinking red text at the end, uh, hardware support for blinking text, by the way, on the 8-bit computer, um, hence my uh, perhaps uh, unwise use of it. Um, but you have, you know, if you think that you can actually do encrypted calls and text on a phone today and that it is actually secure, against any reasonable attacker, I would argue that that is a delusion that needs to be dispelled. Because in all probability, or in all possibility at least, the cellular network can remotely tell your cellular modem firmware to update to a new special upgrade, supplied courtesy of wherever, um, that will change the behavior of the phone. And you know, again, the microphone is on the cellular modem, remember, not on the application processor. It, the application process has to ask the cellular modem nicely to have access to the microphone. Sure, I'll just let Mr. Putin hold the, uh, you know, the, the lead to the microphone uh, while I'm you know, talking to someone uh, about something that I don't want him to hear. Um, unwise, shall we say. Um, and again, we've talked a little bit about this already, but this combination of uh, over integration and the potential for unlawful intercept, whether that's through stingrays or oppressive regimes, you know, as a whole, it's just, gah, it is bad, bad, bad. Um, and again, when you think about the DMA access to all of memory, that means that they, even if a lawful intercept says that they're allowed to get your metadata, your phone calls, and your text messages, because that's probably actually what the, the law provides for without special provision. Uh, in reality, actually, they can get to access all the data, everything that's on your SD card and everything that's in your phone, because you can own 
the application processor. So again, this is uh, quite bad. And again, a theme that we've touched on already and we'll keep coming back to, the incomprehensible complexity of modern devices means it is impossible to make any sensible statements in support of the security of modern devices. So we argue, in fact, then, that the only way to fix this is that we need to cut the complexity of devices. If we want to have a secure device, we simply must reduce the complexity. We need to take out all that which is unnecessary. And we don't need to trim just one or two orders of magnitude off because a billion lines of code, even if we chop you know, a zero off the end, it's still 100 million lines of code to look at. That's going to take me quite a while. Um, even if we chop another zero off and say, OK, now it's only 10 million lines of code, uh, this is really not feasible. It needs to be probably no more than tens of thousands of lines of code, I would argue, for a single person or a small team to have a fighting chance, and not even a certain possibility, but a fighting chance of verifying what is going on in their hardware. But of course, we need that architecture still needs to be useful in some way, right? Uh, because otherwise, uh, again, as Matthew was saying, right, you have this platonic ideal of a computer that you go, yes, it is a computer, it is secure, but it does no computation for you. Um, so how are we then trying to attack this? So and again, we'll go through these in a, a bit more detail, but a bit of road mapping. The key is to deal with the complexity first. We know that this approach and low effort is never going to keep pace with the march of technology. So let's simply embrace obsolescence and wear it you know, with pride. Um, and let's embrace macrification. It's possibly a word that I made up when I wrote this slide. Um, rather than trying to uh, make everything smaller, let's actually just embrace what is a reasonable size that is still portable and usable as a mobile device, but is actually not going to greatly increase the cost of what we're trying to do. And then, of course, all the naughty untrusted bits, in particular the cellular modem, we should quarantine and have in a naughty little sandpit corner uh, as best as we can. Um, and then on the basis that we don't own any chip fabs, which is a bit sad, well, I think there's a, someone was telling me there's a, an open source fab now that's got five micron, which is actually the same as what was made for the Commodore 64, was four and five micron. So we, we should, in fact, be at the point where we could actually make an eight-bit class machine with fully open fab. There is hope. Um, but at the end of all of this, it has to be fun. Otherwise, no one will do it. Um, so let's have a look then, so for reducing the complexity, let's just carve all of the cellular modem complexity out and say too hard for us to do, we will simply treat it as a completely untrustable naughty component. We will give it power when we want it to do things, we will deprive it of power the rest of the time, and we will not give it any kind of access to the main application processor. Um, fortunately, there are these mini PCIe form factor modules, so the, like the vending machines outside for the drinks have probably got one in, totally industry standard. It's been a standard for nearly a decade and will hopefully continue to be a standard for time to come. Um, you can already get them 4G. 5G will come out at some point. So we can just do a socket upgrade of any device that we make and go, look, haha, it's 5G now. Um, and the interfaces are super simple. We have normal UART 115200 bits per second AT commands. And so we can do AT, DT and a phone number and it will dial. And this is a much easier interface to secure and much harder for the cellular network to try and give us malformed responses to AT commands to try and rootkit the phone, right? Um, I'm not going to say that it would be impossible, um, but you're going to have a much, much harder uh, job doing that. And again, just modularizing means that we can swap components out as we go along to really reduce the effort required to, uh, to do things. Right. Um, so, what do I mean by embracing obsolescence? Uh, we know that an Android-like operating system is so insanely complicated that just keeping it up to date has actually become practically impossible. Um, so let's unashamedly choose something which is already obsolete, um, perhaps like this item I have here with me. Um, we can reduce the code size and the CPU complexity to the point where, I mean, you can look at documentation for the Commodore 64 and you know, small children learnt how to program on this. The hardware interface is so simple that it can be fully documented in a book that you can read in the bathtub over a few hours. Uh, what you can do with that, of course, is uh, much more interesting, but it is simple enough that you can verify and understand it 
in practice. And if you need to verify your machine on a regular basis, this is the only way to do it. Because even if you said Intel with all the king's horses and all the king's men could fully verify the CPU and someone could fully verify an operating system once off, which is kind of what the military do, um, and then get surprised when things get hacked down the track. Uh, you need to be able to do on-demand verification so that you can have full digital sovereignty, because that, in fact, actually is what full digital sovereignty is. Um, the trade-off, and again, clearly I was typing slides too late at night, um, the trade-off trade um, is somewhat reduced uh, capabilities. So the question is, can we make something which is still going to be useful enough, which we'll come back to. Um, so macrification. By this, really, I mean no naughty BGAs, um, no wafer thin PCBs. Um, it has to be stuff that you can just go, right, OK, I'm going to you know, use a typical online service, get a four layer board made, put an FPGA module in a socket so that someone else has dealt with the whole uh, BGA thing. Cheap to iterate, you can pull your FPGA board out, replace the main board, put more components on, do whatever you want. So suddenly, you can now put the craziest hardware um, in your phone, whether that be a joystick port or otherwise, um, and you can do this cheaply and easily. This starts to get really interesting. Um, we've already, for the most part, talked about isolating the, um, the naughty cellular modem um, by not having those directly connected. So this, of course, actually does allow you to have fully encrypted conversation. If you do a data over GSM voice, and there are a bunch of codecs around, there's some open source work on that as well, you can actually get enough bandwidth to run David Rowe's codec 2. So you could actually have a full voice codec over an analog, uh, sorry, a, um, a digital GSM voice circuit, narrow band, uh, but actually be fully encrypted end to end. Um, in the phone that we're making, we're going to put a hardware one time pad. So if you want to get really paranoid, you can actually have a one-time pad-protected encrypted conversation over the cellular network, and no one then, in theory, short of having physical access to either of your devices, uh, should have any decent chance of, uh, of getting access to that. Uh, and then we're also providing a paranoid mode, uh, which I can give a mild demonstration of here. If I do this key combination, this is what we call the matrix mode. Uh, and so now I have full access to the CPU. I can stop the CPU. I can inspect memory. I can do whatever I want, and there is nothing the CPU running behind that can do to stop it. The CPU is actually running uh, behind. We can do a demo with a game or something, and we can modify as we go along. Um, so we can add facilities <laughs> uh, that are somewhat unthinkable uh, with an existing uh, kind of device. We could, in fact, actually add a high-performance x86 ARM or you know, RISC-V or whatever processor to that, and the trick is, all of the things like the input and output devices you want on the 8-bit computer that you can trust, and then when you say, oh, well, I'm happy to do something untrustworthy like use the web, um, you can do that in a nice ARM processor or whatever uh, as you wish uh, and get that balance of usability and security. Um, and we've pretty much covered all of this, really, I think. Um, so you know, we can implement all of the kind of funny interfaces that you need on a phone. So we've got somewhere in the bag um, uh, the, an 800 by 480 LCD screen is what we're going to use on the, um, the prototype phone. It's going to be about the size of a 3DS XL. And we've got the touch interface. We can do all of that funky stuff. We can touch dial uh, with the phone on that. And so by moving everything to hardware, it's much harder to buffer overrun VHDL than it is C, um, partly because it's much harder to write VHDL in the first place. Um, but such is life. Take the good with the bad. Um, and of course, we can change it as we go along. Again, we want permissionless, easy, barrier-free innovation to mobile phones in a way that, at the moment, uh, is otherwise impossible. So let's get on to the fun bits then. So the Mega 65 phone um, is our kind of proof by example that this kind of insanity um, is possible to do, even if misguided. Um, so we're going to make, as I say, something about the size of a 3DS XL. It'll be about 210 millimeters wide, um, about 110 millimeters high and about three, three and a half centimeters thick. Um, backward compatible with the Commodore 64 and Commodore 65. Um, actually very important because you don't want to have a stillborn platform for which there is no software. You want something to do when you're stuck on the train with the phone, right? So if you can't play Impossible Mission, then you know where are you? Um, secure audio path we've talked about, crazy hardware additions, and again, that bug has obviously hit me as I was writing a slide. Um, so, we, if we can make it, but will it be practical? Will it be usable? Can it do anything useful whatsoever? And now we have to load part two of the slides when it comes up. 
Hello? Oh, I have to get out of presentation mode first before I get my cursor back. Open slides too, because of course, we only have limited memory to hold a certain number of slides in memory. <laughs> right, back into presentation mode. Okay, so, oops, ah, on F5, cool. Um, so we already have everything working on the bench. As I say, we can get it down to this kind of, uh, you know, roughly the size of a Nintendo 3DS, but a little bit thicker. The PCB allowed is very excitingly happening back at Flinders University as I speak. Uh, we had enough student projects working on it that we got enough engineering workshop time allocated to the project that we could ask them very nicely to make up the PCBs for this year's batch of students to work on it. Um, and because, you know, partly to demonstrate the, uh, the ease of innovation, uh, we're adding all manner of bizarre hardware to it uh, that suits my particular taste, but you can make hardware that suits your particular taste. Uh, so in my case, um, I, you know, my big fat heavy laptop is because I kind of go tromping in the jungles of Vanuatu doing disaster communications work. So I want a phone that has a solar panel on it so that the phone will never go flat. Because it's, you know, thanks to macrification, we can get two watts of high performance solar cell, um, courtesy of the uh, Flinders University solar uh, race vehicle supplies. Um, interestingly, the panel's only about 10 bucks. Um, so we can put that just bloop on the back. Um, we want it to sound good when we are playing games or annoying people with SID tunes on the train. Um, so we found a supplier of four centimeter, two watt, three millimeter thick speakers. Um, so this will sound uh, really good. Um, I hate noise when I'm on a call. So we're gonna put four microphones and do active noise cancellation in hardware um, so that it should actually be really good at rejecting background noise uh, out from calls. Um, I hate TVs. On, in cafes and things, and you're trying to talk with people and you can't hear them, and all you can see is strange things happening on in the background. Uh, so we found a supplier of, I think they're 200 milliwatt infrared LEDs. Um, so a TV in the far back of the theater should be totally doable. Um, probably you could sit in one cafe and turn off the TV in a cafe on the other side of the street. Um, I'm looking forward to finding out the limits of range on that. Uh, and finally, uh, I'm adding real, value, uh, real volume knobs, one for in-call audio, one for speakerphone audio, and one for media. Um, so if anyone remembers XKCD 1884, uh, with the perils of setting the media volume output level on mobile phones, um, that won't be a problem for us at all. We'll have a separate knob for it. Um, it'll be great. Um, and the full prototyping cost, well, this is actually not counting the engineering time of the um, PCB layout, but the, the hardware is, we're talking substantially under $1,000. FPGA board, the whole lot. We can 3D print a case and all of that kind of funky stuff. And we'll actually have something which is basically a working mobile phone that will you know, do feature phone kind of things with, you know, I think we've, we've probably put about four person years in. And of course, a lot of that is actually making it Commodore 64 compatible so we can play all the games that we want to. Um, so it's suddenly within the reach um, again, as you know, in the keynote when they were talking about making the, uh, you know, the, the, artificial, uh, the open artificial uh, pancreas, it was possible because the amount of effort required to do something useful and interesting had been reduced down to that which was possible by a hobby project. And so we're trying to do that uh, here. Okay, so why on earth do we want to make something Commodore 64 and Commodore 65 compatible? Uh, perhaps if we begin at the bottom of the list uh, and work our way up from there. Um, it is, of course, just plain fun uh, to have... Uh, the world's fastest Commodore 64 in a portable form factor that can take and make phone calls. Um, but also, as I said, the fact that there are thousands of game titles and actually productivity software that was used seriously, um, like in Germany in particular, people were still running Geos on Commodore 64s in the late 90s. I know because I was selling them software to connect them to old PCs to use the hard drive in the PC to power their Geos-based Commodore 64s. Um, and that was preferable to them uh, rather than actually running a PC. Um, and there's lots of people who know how to write uh, software uh, and everything for that. And people know how to get good performance out of this simple machine. So to my mind, it kind of has all the right uh, ingredients uh, in there. We're also helped that uh, because we're working on making the desktop version of the Mega 65 computer, we've got a bunch of crazy guys uh, who are helping us to, uh, to do a whole pile of the work as well. So it's just kind of, there's a, a bunch of uh, uh, factors in there. Um, Ah, yes. So the audio isolation. Uh, so again, b because we can, I thought, hmm, how shall I do the audio path? Uh, so I implemented in the FPGA fabric the, uh, the audio path to the cellular modem. I thought, hmm, okay, that's all well and good. Um, 
but how do we kind of choose whether you're in call profile and all that kind of stuff? Oh, stuff it. I'll make a 16 input, 8 output, full crossbar audio mixer um, in hardware. This is quite cheap to do in an FPGA. Um, so we can do really weird things. If you want to have a private conversation with someone, you could plug in your headset um, and have a conversation with someone on the phone while simultaneously playing completely different audio. You could be playing Impossible Mission or some other, you know, whiz ball, whatever you like, uh, actually playing a game while you're having a discrete conversation with someone. Um, and of course, that's going to make it harder for anyone who's actually trying to listen in to you to pick it out because it's background noise that they can hear that you can't hear and all of that kind of fun stuff. Anyway, it sounded like a fun idea. Um, so we did it, because we could, which is the whole point, right? Uh, whereas at the moment, with the traditional approach, that's just not a possibility. And as we say, you know, a few person years uh, and not that much cost of hardware. Um, so can it be useful? And here really is kind of this question of, well, define useful. What do you want your device to do? Traditionally, of course, we're stuck with the devices that we can buy uh, on the open market, and they can do a lot of stuff because they want to sell to a lot of people. Um, but it might actually be that, you know, if what you mostly want to do is to play games on the train, um, this would be a fantastic device and not have to carry a phone separately. Or if you're highly paranoid about uh, the security of communications. But again, I still think that the really, the, the killer use for this, uh, other than for, you know, people that are uh, under unfriendly uh, environments, really is the ability to customise mobile phones cheaply enough that those amongst us who are not uh, you know, uh, able to use a traditional mobile phone easily, and that could be as simple as, you know, your grandmother who wants a phone that just has one big red button, that is, you know, call the daughter. Um, you know, if you want to do that, suddenly this becomes a whole lot uh, easier to do. Uh, and so, you know, there's a bunch of things that we can do. Um, will it be able to do everything? Can we run PowerPoint on it? Probably not. Um, can we, you know, run a browser and email? Probably gets, I mean, there are browsers for the Commodore 64. Um, there's actually a selection of browsers for the Commodore 64, which comes perhaps as a, a mild surprise. Um, and likewise, we should be able to make it a decently functional email client as well, right? Um, so really, it depends on where you want to define useful, what problem you're trying to solve. Uh, in lots of cases, this won't be the right device, but there are cases at the moment where the existing devices, I would argue, are definitely not the right uh, device. And so it's about having that choice. So let's get to the fun part of things then. Um, any questions before we move on to demos? Yes, we have a question at the back. How, are you doing the variable font How am I doing the variable width font rendering? An excellent question. Um, so it's all in hardware. So those who are familiar with the old 8-bit uh, kind of space, so 8 by 8 characters with you know, 1 bit per pixel. On the Mega 65, we can have 8 bits per pixel, so we can have 256 colors you can set a different mode that makes those alpha values between foreground and background. So that's how we get the nice anti-alias text. And then there are some extra bits that you can specify on the characters that sets the kerning trim on the right of the character. Uh, so this is, you know, if we changed where the character set was getting fetched from, we'd actually see that it's all, you know, blocked around where the, um, uh, the text is. Cool. Excellent. Are you looking at this as potentially servile replacement hardware? Sorry, say again? Are you looking at this as potentially servile replacement hardware for your other okay, project? Okay, so yes, because of my servile mesh background, um, there is naturally convergence. So what I didn't talk about that it's going to be in this hardware is we're putting a pair of LoRa radios in this as well, uh, in the, the ones that we were making in the lab. So these will be Commodore 64s that you'll be able to play two-player games over 10 kilometres in an urban area um, <laughs> without any cellular network. So the world can go to pot, and you can still be you know, playing Pit Stop 2 or something with a friend, right? Um, but more seriously, again, you know, the solar panel and all of these things, and the, we're putting a 32 watt hour battery, this will be a fantastic phone for off-grid use. And again, if we think about you know, journalists under oppressive regimes and all of this kind of thing, a phone which is energy independent and communications independent as much as possible actually has real value uh, for those kind of contexts. Do you want another question or demo yeah, first no, and then question, question later? Number's too long. Sure, I had my, yeah, yeah, like in Germany, yeah, yeah no, as I said, we tried it yesterday and it didn't work, oh, that's because I haven't run the dialer software yet, 
But uh, so, so I wanted to give you enough time for a few of you to, to note down the number. Yep, take it. Okay, the last, uh, one question. Uh, wh while you turn away, if someone has physical access to your phone, yeah. and you still, still has false feeling of trust to your phone. Correct, that's right. And so we can't solve all of the problems all in one go. Um, and that's a really hard problem to solve. If you're dealing with state level actors, I would actually argue that that's a unsolvable problem. Um, so we just have to keep things uh, uh, as much as we can. So let's go back into the freeze menu. So yeah. What about uh, Open BTS project? Uh, it, it, it seems like community worked out how to do GSM in uh, SDRs already. Yeah, and that's great. I'm glad they're doing it. We'd love to get their implementation in a, a mini PCIe form factor and then book, put it straight in. Right? So we, we decouple all of these parts. Uh, so where are we? So we need telephone. Whoops, when I get down there. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Right, uh, let's go fast CPU, resume. So this is the next kind of fun bit. The dialer, sorry? Excellent, excellent, well done sir. Um, the dialer, like the entire, like the mobile phone UI thing, um, we've written in a slight extension to Commodore 64 Basic. <laughs> so you're now watching, that's the entire dialer software that you've just seen go past. Again, think verification you know, and you know, sovereignty and all of these sorts of things. You know, if you want to change things. So it's 28 kilobytes of untokenized ASCII text. <laughs> Someone's trying to ring me. If it will answer. Come on. Hello? Hang on, we need to turn up the audio again. Hey. Who was beeping? So the, the, the bottom oscilloscope line, that's me, with the microphone in here, and the top one is the cellular network. Yes? Uh, no, that's not the cell network. We can tell because it's on the top half of the, um, uh, the display. So let's hang that call up. <laughs> Go back to the, uh, the thing. <laughs> yeah, that's right, yeah. Hello. Hello? Oh, there we are. Oh, no, 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 it's call waiting. Someone else is trying. <laughs> Who is the wise guy that's trying to call at the same time? <laughs> yeah, I can see one there. Stop that. <laughs> so we see what that call opened, have we? Was it? Okay, right, so let's just. Because yeah. Yeah. <laughs> of course, all the AT responses from the modem. So here's another thing that your phone probably can't do. If I press T, So if the dialer doesn't support the feature, you can do it yourself. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, yeah, it'll say ring. Yeah. And then this will be confused because the user interface doesn't know what's going on. Oh, hello. But well, the audio path is in hardware, remember? This is the AV room. Now, what gets really fun, because remember, hardware audio path, we'll just turn the, the gain down a little bit here. Oh, okay. Hello, AVHQ. Hello. AVHQ. Deep breathing from AVHQ. <laughs> uh, you're breaking up slightly. Hey. Yeah, we need to, there's some signed, unsigned audio things in the, the mixer <laughs> we need to sort out. But, you know. Um, so what gets really fun is that we can, while they're still on the line, right, um, we can reset. The call is, the call is still in progress. So, hello, <laughs> AV, can you say something? Yep, yep, hello, hello. <laughs> <laughs> so. So for the people listening on YouTube later on, there was AV HQ that's listening in on a completely different room trying to intercept. Yeah. Um, so, uh, what, 
would you prefer Impossible Mission or would you prefer Whizball? Whizball. Whizball. Okay, you've been outvoted by everyone here. They want Whizball. Um, so we have a few video display glitches with Whizball, um, but that's fine. Uh, I did. I picked the disc, didn't I? Already. Yep. So let's go. Blah, blah, load Whizball. And you can hear me typing because the microphone is picking up. Um, AV, can you say something? It'll be hard to hear them over the... The line levels aren't well balanced. Not yet, but ag again, um, and we'll, we'll spare them listening to endless uh, music. Yes, that's right, yes. <laughs> Indeed. Um, so, oh, yeah, they're still there. Hey, um, you're welcome to stand the line or you can... Uh, uh, hang on. So now we're officially out of time. We're now into the break. I'm happy for us to keep having fun as long as people would like to have fun, but don't feel obliged to stay. So yeah, I, sh I should say this yes. uh, before, but feel free to stay and we'll have fun. But uh, on behalf of everyone here, thank you very much. As a small token of our appreciation. That was awesome. Thank you very much. Thanks.